everybody, welcome back. We are now going to take a look at a specific facet of a development called Wallerstein's World Systems Theory, which is a way in which to describe the relationships between developed and underdeveloped countries. So we got to start a little bit more broadly with what's called the core periphery model. Um, it's, this is not particularly difficult to understand because we've been talking all year about most developed countries versus least developed countries. The core periphery model is just a model that's used to explain the economic, political, or cultural power and or cultural power and how it's spatially distributed across the earth. In some places, they're the dominant, economically powerful, quote-unquote, core countries. And there's also marginal or dependent countries that depend upon others, known as semi-periphery or periphery countries. More simplistically, there are core countries, most developed countries of the world, who are economically powerful and dominant in world politics. And there are marginal or lesser developed countries, LDCs, that are developing countries, who are often dependent upon the, that core for all kinds of materials and and, are, and simply do not have as much global power. So not, not particularly difficult to understand this concept of what the core and periphery model are. In some ways, um, and I'm going to come back to this term in a second, there's some people argue that the world has haves and haves nots, people who have things and people who do not. That's an enormous generalization, but we're going to work with the term as we apply it to the world systems theory. The characteristics of the core, this is not difficult because this also reflects much of our class discussion. The core countries are urban, they're highly industrialized, they have powerful governments, they have financial power. I also mentioned on the, the um the graphic on the right, there's uh, also strong education systems. The periphery, um, there's the primary, there's the most people are working in the primary sector of the economy. So you see their rural, mining, forestry, agriculture, very little political power, very little military power, little economic power to an extent. Um, you see that the term to come back from first from the second unit. These countries often experience brain drain. People often leave and do not come back to de further develop the country. And economically speaking, people are earning pretty low wages. The semi-periphery, which is not represented necessarily on the graphic here, um, are the, the countries that have characteristics of both. That They give some characteristics of a core, some characteristics of a periphery country. This is where that term, again, the haves and have-nots, the idea that there's countries that have resources, have power, have influence, and there's countries that do not. Well, we're going to take a look now at this. Um, well, actually, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. There's actually something called the Brandt Line, or the North-South Divide, and we brought this up earlier in the year, but I want to re revisit this. Um, looking at this concept of the core and the periphery, we're looking right now at a more North Polar Projection Map. Ooh, didn't that feel good? Go back to first unit. Um, the North Polar Projection Map is going to be, imagine right now, the screen, the, when you're looking at this screen, imagine you're looking at the top of the Earth down. That's, that's the perspective that we're looking at. You see the North Pole is in the middle there. In fact, I'm going to point to it here. You see our North Pole right here in the middle. We've got our North Pole. There's uh, a gentleman developed this in the 1960s, and it was the called the, the Brant Line or the North-South Divide, which is a reference to the fact that this, if we were to draw a line around approximately 30 degrees north latitude, imagine your Earth. Okay, imagine the Earth being round. Here's our North Pole. Imagine again the round Earth. That if we were going to go, the equator would be somewhere out here. If we were going to go to 30 degrees north. And we really, sometimes it's 20 degrees north, but generally speaking, we'll say 30 degrees north. If you see around here, that if we generally drew a line, that that, and we encompass those countries in the middle, then we're, those countries comprise the most, the, the majority of the most developed countries of the world, as well as Australia, right? Makes sense here when we consider that these are the co colonial powers. These are in Western Europe. These are the countries that went out and colonized places like North America, places like South Pacific and uh, in Australia. We'll come back to Latin America momentarily. But this uh, this north northern concentrated region is known as the as or is not known as, but is represented by these wealthy countries of Europe, America, Japan. Japan is also included here. You see that's why we got that thirty degrees to include Japan. Um, and generally outside of that, in the southern hemisphere, are in the poorer countries of the world, of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And this is, uh, actually you see here that the poorest 20% of the world lives in the southern hemisphere. We're going to talk about why, because it's, it's completely inaccurate to say this is a reflection of the distribution of the resources of the world. The majority of this really comes back again to that colonialism and that imperialism, where these nations went out and took over other places. And they created the systems whereby these periphery countries, think about peripheral vision, your side vision. So if here's your core, think about like, I don't know, your eyeball, here your retina. And then you got here the periphery, your peripheral vision. 
These core countries created systems whereby the periphery countries are dependent upon the core. These core countries would go out and take raw materials from these regions, bring them back to the core, manufacture them, and then sell them back. That was a system that was defined, the economics of the 1800s. On the whole, we just need to know that this Brandt line, north-south divide, is the division, is the representation of the division between the wealthy countries of Europe and America, Japan and Australia, as it pertains to 30 degrees north latitude um, versus the poorest countries living on the periphery. Okay, so that's the, po that's the concepts of the core and the periphery, on the whole. MDCs, LDCs, but we're using the terminology core and periphery. There's a gentleman named Wallerstein who in the 1960s came up with utilizing this core periphery model, utilizing the same concept of where the, here are the most developed and the least developed countries of the world. He developed something called the world systems theory. And the world systems theory, it was a way to explain the economic relationships between these areas of the world. And he used this concept of essentially answering, wh not why, but expl explaining how the entire world is economically interdependent upon one another and how that interdependence is both unfair and how that interdependence of the world perpetuates, meaning continues, this idea that there are core countries of the world and there are periphery countries of the world. So Wallerstein took the ideas of the core periphery model and applied it to the economic systems that intertwine the rest of this world. So, our definition. World systems theory was an approach to world history and to social change. And it suggests that there's a world economic system, a system of an economy that connects everybody, in which some countries benefit, those are the core countries, and others are exploited. Exploited means take advantage of, taken advantage of. So if you've got exploited, sorry, there's the bell. Exploited on the left and taken advantage of on the right. The core countries benefit, the peripheries are taken advantage of. That's, again, the return of this concept of the haves and the have-nots. The, the world economy, as you see here, this is not terribly different than the, than the concept of the core and periphery, but simply this idea is that there are some who are taking advantage of others in order to make themselves core countries. So we got a three-tiered hierarchy. We already explained this. The core countries, they dominate and they exploit peripheral countries for labor and raw materials. Let's look at this graphic. The core countries are going to utilize the cheap labor and the raw materials of the periphery countries. And those periphery countries consider outsourcing, right? They're going to produce cheap labor, and they're going to uh, we're going to take the raw materials. Not we, core countries are going to take raw materials, and they're going to be brought to the core. The core is then going to manufacture or going to create high profit consumption goods. And in the core is where you're going to see um, the creation of um, even though they're manufactured in China. Some, but you can see like the iPhone here, right? There's the iPhone because. The core is benefiting from the cheap labor and raw materials of the periphery. The core countries are now able to create these high-tech industries and these high-tech jobs. In essence, the core is able to create a tertiary economy because the per periphery is providing the resources and the raw material. Peripheral countries are dependent upon the core for capital. Capital, again, we talked about this when we talked about capital-intensive uh, or capital-intensive farming. Capital, again, is the money, right, needed for production. So with that, the semi-periphery countries are the countries that are going to depend upon both. So, the that periphery, oh, I was on that definition there. The capital is, again, the money needed for um, investment, money to start up. So, uh, simplistically, capital is money, but generally speaking, you refer to capital as the money you need in order to do something. You can't just go out and, and well, I guess you're, unless you're really rich, but you can't really just go out and just and start businesses and industries. You need investments. You need capital. You need money that can be used to invest in things, period. Periphery countries are often dependent upon the core countries for capital. They don't necessarily have the money necessary for startups. Oh, there's that bell again. Um, so in so that, that's, that's kind of reminiscent of what we talked about in political geography when we talked about IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and we talked about the World Bank, and we talked about the way in which those countries, those institutions, um, specifically the World Bank, applies loans to lesser developed countries of the world to give them that capital. Here is X amount of money to build X bridge to provide X services to people. Semi-periphery countries are the ones who share the characteristics of both. But in some, what this entire system is sort of rooted upon is this idea that Wallerstein acknowledges that the system of capitalism, that the system of um, using supply and demand to control the prices of goods, is ultimately going to lead to this system of a core country exploiting a periphery 
leading to general global inequality, that there will always be this core of industrialized regions, not always, but there'll be a core of industrialized regions, and there's going to be an area that loses, the periphery. So who are these core countries? What are the characteristics? So remember again, before we go any further, capitalism, which we talked about at the beginning of this, video, of this unit, was the process of letting competitive market, for market forces or competitive markets determine the prices of goods. Rather than the government saying, you will sell bread for this price, is to say, private citizens, I want to start a bread company and I'm going to sell it for this much. And other citizens saying, well, I want to start a bread company and I'm going to sell it for $5 cheaper. That's, that's capitalism. It's, it's natural competition of forces, of supply and demand. Both good and bad, but capitalism would be what Wallerstein is arguing is causing this system of the haves and the have-nots, as did Karl Marx. Um, so core countries are the dominant capitalist countries, and they have, they have strong military power. You've got a military to back up your force and back up you, what you want to do. Um, there's really little dependency upon other countries in the sense of there's dependency that capitalist countries want, or core countries, excuse me, want to take cheap labor and raw materials, but if not, there, there's no reason that, there, there's little reason that a core country needs to answer to another country is a good way to phrase it. They don't have, the core country's economy is not necessarily dependent it's not like the core country's economy couldn't stand on its own two feet. Um, that was very wordy. But no dependence upon other countries. Core countries serve the needs of the higher class. Sorry. So generally speaking, these are the more economically uh, focused. Oh, no. Econo the, the, the higher classes are often benefiting the most from the economies. And the economy the, and the whole is focused upon higher skill, capital-intensive activities, just tertiary activities. So capital-intensive meaning it costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of money to start up a Google, right? You need people. You need people who need to be paid well. You need people who are educated and educated well to, to go into to creating some of these products. So those are, those are kind of the, core, the key characteristics of the core countries. And uh, this is redundant, so that you do not need to copy this down, but we just need to keep this in mind. So the core countries, because of the power that they have from all those characteristics, they can then obtain these lower prices for raw material and cheap labor from the periphery. They can do it. They can demand it. They can seek it, and they have the ability to take advantage of it. They have access to transportation systems. They have access to communication. They have access to money that would allow, that would allow the core country to then take advantage of the uh, materials of the, core, the periphery countries. The very initial examples provided, again, this was a theory that came up in the 1960s, United Kingdom, France, and Holland actually was another one of the examples provided. In modern day, we can add to those Japan, the United States, Japan, Germany, most of Western Europe, uh, Australia. These are going to be, uh, just generally speaking, the most developed countries of the world, are the core countries. The exist oh, and there you go again. So the existing cores, if we're going to speak regionally of the world economy, we've got North America, we've got Europe, and we've got Japan slash Southeast Asia. But Japan's the core of that. But it's also important to know, though, this is where we're coming back to this idea of regional difference. It's not as if every single part of every single one of these countries is extremely developed. Rather, this concept of the world economy really operates through what's called a network of world cities. It's the major cities of each of these places that's driving this world development, this core development. World cities are cities with a, uh, places that have a disproportionate. Disproportionate means does not match. Disproportionate means more than um, more than others. Okay, so places with a disproportionate share of pol economic, political, and cultural influence. If you think about the United States, if you think about somewhere like uh, Des Moines, or you think about Fargo in North in North Dakota, New York City has so much more contribution to our industrial world economy than those areas do. Is that bad? No, but that's just simply a regional difference in a core country. You can see there in the bottom map that the, the core cities, the world cities of these different regions, Tokyo and Japan is driving its world economy and its, and its status as a core country. Um, so it's, keep, it's important to keep in mind that there are cores within cores. There are core areas of countries within cores. Um, they do not need to copy this down. I just wanted to show you, this is kind of a cool representation. Um, of It says the 1300, 13, the 1,318, terrible phrasing, 1,318 transnational corporations that form the core of the economy. And super connected companies are red and very connected companies are in yellow. The size of the dot represents their revenue. In other words, we have here that it's the trans, these transnational corporations all over the world are often what's driving whether or not a place is a core country or not. So that doesn't always necessarily mean that the entire country is part of um, one of these particular characteristics. Let's flip our perspective to periphery countries. Periphery countries lack a strong central government. And periphery countries 
may be controlled by another state, may have be uh, a colony, may simply have an enormous dependence upon another country, so they're economically controlled by another state. Um, for the vast majority of their economy is based upon exporting raw materials to core countries. They may even depend upon the core countries for capital. Another connection back to agriculture, consider Green Revolution, that were dependent upon MDCs for the capital or the core countries for the capital to start Green Revolution techniques, but just generally speaking, um, agribusiness or commercial agriculture on the whole. Usually there's underdeveloped economies, so, or excuse me, underdeveloped industry, and on the whole, the economy is defined by low-skill, labor-intensive production. So cheap labor really is what that means. The so labor that where people are not necessarily paid well, and they're not necessarily do, necessarily doing high-skilled labor. Uh, the periphery countries, the initial examples that were provided in this, so the historic examples, were Eastern Europe and Latin America. Now, that we cannot go further without saying that that has now changed. A lot of Eastern Europe are now developing um, countries for sure, particularly after the fall of the Soviet Union. When countries could now go to capitalist states, they can rather than being communist and having the government dictate their prices for everything and control all parts of their their country. Now these countries are becoming um, developing states. Similarly, Latin well similarly in that Latin America is now almost entirely developing countries of the world. Very few part, very few regions of Latin America are considered now LDCs or periphery countries. Now, the most modern LDCs, um, it applies to Africa, the, sadly the entirety of Africa, but the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, Northern Africa is more developed than um, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, South Africa is not. So regionally, yes, but in particular the country of South Africa um, is particularly developed. Much of Central Asia is considered to be less uh, a periphery country periphery countries, and the Pacific Rim, Pacific Rim referring to the nations in the Pacific, the um, many of the island nations there. So let's, then what about semi-periphery countries? Okay, so semi-periphery countries are often referred to as newly industrialized countries, NICs. You've seen that, that I actually remember the, I think the AP exam had referred to them that way last year, maybe it was the year before, but newly industrialized countries. Um, these are, they have a median standard of living, meaning they're moderate. The conditions of living are um, better than a periphery, but maybe not necessarily as developed as a most developed country of the world, a core country. The citizens of these semi-periphery countries often have access to different economic activities. So uh, let's think about that like the citizens may have the opportunity to go into a manufacturing job. They may have access to some higher education. But typically, there's a significant gap between the rich and the poor. There's certain groups of people who are taking advantage of these opportunities, but the vast, but the society itself is still shifting. Consider if we went all the way back for a semi-periphery country. We went back to the discussion here about um, their, I'm going all the way back, to the sectors of the job. You would see if there's a country, a shift in between these two that there'd be, um, for, for a developing nation, for a semi-periphery country, you'd have fewer people in the primary sector, more in the secondary sector, and an increasing number in the tertiary sector. So that's sort of the, just logically, the shift towards a tertiary society. Sorry, now i got to go all the way back here. Okay. Uh, oh, too far, too far. Okay. Um, semi-periphery countries, again, they experience the characteristics of both. Um, it could be either a core region now, I'm, I'm, when I say this, I'm going to speak within a country for a moment. It could be a core region that's in decline, so let's think Rust Belt, for example, or a periphery region that's undergoing development. A per semi-periphery country, for the most part, would be one that's moving, that's progressing forward, that the, for the most part, that a semi-periphery country would be one that's developing. If we were going to apply the core periphery model to a country, then we could consider an area that's deindustrializing, perhaps as a semi-periphery country, semi-periphery region, because it has manufacturing but is decreasing. Okay, key examples of semi-periphery countries. These are ones that um, probably surprised you at the beginning of the year, but no longer will. Are India, China, and Brazil just key key examples of developing nations? China may be what's in your mind sticking out as a particularly unique example, but we're gonna and we'll dive much more deeply in that in class, but. You can see, I mean, China's GDP is certainly expanded, as, as shown on those graphs there. Um, and then there's experiencing tremendous growth, but it cannot be, you can't forget that 
consider again this concept of regions. There, are, there might be core regions of China, but that certainly doesn't mean that every single person is experiencing develop, a wealth. And it certainly doesn't mean that the entire country has shifted out of, I mean, it's a com it still remains a communist country. I mean, whether that's, that's changing, a lot of the regulations are changing, but the, the, that can't, we can't consider just because we hear in the news that China's economy is expanding, that doesn't necessarily mean it's touching the lives of all the people. Um, Brazil, key, as this is just an um, article, I'll probably give this one to you in class, about a mo as should Brazil be the ro role model for development, how we can see how Brazil has continued to, to really skyrocket and lead the way in development in Latin America. Um, another example is just India. Think about that outsourcing video. That's, India is still largely dependent upon core countries for capital, so they're still largely dependent upon that outsourcing of industry from core countries. But that's also, as we saw, it also has its own emerging consumer market and growing technology sector. Just like that multiplier effect shows us, as soon as the development came, the development continued. So that's a uh, semi-periphery region. Now there's an important other characteristic which is something that's called the external areas. And external areas are regions that maintain their own economic system. So there are external areas are, are places that Wallerstein said are outside of this world systems analysis and this world systems theory, that they're not participating in this world economy. Places, these places would have their own labor market. They would have, oh, that's, they'd have their own market for the goods. I'm sorry, this is a typo here. They have their own labor source, um, so the people themselves are not necessarily coming from other places, or, nor are people from other places producing goods for this country. They own their own, uh, they have their own market where they're selling their goods, and they create crops and goods for their own people, their own market. Redundant, but the idea is, that they that this this um, country essentially is self-sufficient. It operates on its own. And the historic example of that is Russia. Um, that historically Russia had a powerful had a very has had a very powerful government. And the inter internal trade, the trade within the country, has superseded external trade. They don't have large-scale um, international development in Russia. And the, the goods and the manufacturing that are being produced in Russia, for the most part, were going towards the Russian citizens. Now, I have to say that this has changed. I mean, this is really changing. There's an article um, back in, what was that, two, I guess 2009, that was really breaking down all of the different, the, uh, the introduction of special economic zones in Russia. So Russia is now starting to introduce and encourage foreign investment, recognizing that that's the only way that Russia will ever move past a, uh, a secondary, a semi-periphery, I guess you could, well, it's not semi-periphery, a developing nation. The only way it will become a most developed nation is through opening its borders and its economic system to greater foreign investment. So you can see um, on the top map there, it shows you some of the, it says free economic zones. Those are the special economic zones where they're encouraged, they have favorable tax rates and they're encouraging for foreign development um, in order to drive their economy. So historically, Russia was an example of an external area, not a participant in the global economy. And that's still on the whole true, but it's not necessarily as true as it was 25 years ago. Last concept here is that the core periphery model and the Wallerstein's model, just generally speaking, this applies at many scales. Remember, think of think of zooming in on a city versus zooming all the way out and taking a look at the world. If you forgot what scale of analysis means, which you should not, but if you did from the first unit, um, you're, it's, you're familiar with this because we've done it all year. We're looking at issues from various levels. Is this a national problem? Is this a local problem? Is this an international problem? Or is it an international term? So consider that there can be cores at many scales. Here's an example. LA is the core of Southern California. That In that way, we're looking regionally to see where's the core. Japan is the core of Southeast Asia. And then I included a map here. But even within Japan, there is a core region. So the Tokyo Yakama, Yokohama district in Japan is the industrial core of Japan. Um, Johannesburg is a core region of South Africa. So if we're looking at it on the national scale, if you're talking about the United States, that's one of your analysis questions. We looked at this of the industrial core regions and which areas would be semi-periphery and which areas would be periphery regions of the United States. So this core periphery model applies to countries, but it also applies within the borders of a given country. Whew, okay, there it is. So three relatively simple analysis questions for the first three. Number four um, is it, I want some I want some real analysis here. Which regions of the United States would you argue are our industrial cores? Ooh, that's not complete. And which areas are our periphery? Okay, so that's what I need to see from you. 
go ahead and pause these and you will be using this to complete your industrial um, economic analysis of your geopolitics team. All right, that's it.